So now let's carry this argument about justice into some of the ramifications as well as talk about some possibilities of the definition of God. I'm not doing this to try to convince you of anything. I'm just trying to flesh out the issues, hopefully in one more audio, which is going to be hard to do. I'll probably m mess it up. First of all, no matter what definition of God you come up with, If God, of any definition, then why injustice? And the atheist debate, the guy that's running that channel, began and ended his video that I had linked in my first version of this Towards a Better Atheism. He began and ended his video saying that first, at the beginning, somebody with an extremely debilitating disease that is very painful and long-lasting, you know, how could God be fair to allow that to happen? And then he closed his video with a sort of broader statement of injustice about, you know, hunger and all the horrors of this world. He's right to ask those questions. But I would extend them. <clears throat> In fact, my arguments against God go farther than what he's even saying. His arguments are good, but to me they don't go far enough. And if you've heard <clears throat> many of my audios in the Sad Strat series, you'll have heard me say this many times. My argument to God is, why did you even invent P? According to the Bible, Adam was made human before he sinned, okay? There were animals. <clears throat> and it was Adam's task to be the first taxonomist. He was not a hunter-gatherer, but a scientist. And it was his job to run around naming the animals, and part of the humor of that statement in the Bible is that he couldn't find anybody just like him. He found mates. Get this. He found mates for everybody else but himself. And so Genesis 2 concludes by saying, well, okay, I'm going to make him a helper. It's very funny. Okay, it's meant to be funny. It's a comic chapter. God's pretending like he didn't know that <clears throat> Adam had no mate. And Adam was running around naming everybody and couldn't find a mate for himself. Okay, now think about this. The reproductive organs... And the elimination organs are right next to each other, literally, especially in the man. Uh, why did God do that? Wouldn't he know <clears throat> that it would make the sex act a problem? I and mean, presumably you know what the sex act is, okay? Wouldn't that make it a problem? Now, <clears throat> the flip side of that is that peeing wouldn't feel good if he didn't place those organs next to each other. I don't know how much you know about the biology, but what makes pee feel good is the same thing that makes the sex act feel good. But the fact that the excreting organs, to put it somewhat charitably, are right next to the reproductive organs also makes the sex act, sex act kind of problematic and messy. Why did God do that? That's before sin entered the world. See, if you if you as an atheist are to argue with a Christian about why evil, the first thing your typical Christian is going to say is that, well, evil is in the world because sin is in the world. Okay, but there are a whole lot of injustices just in the creation of man even before sin. And my top number one argument is why pee, why breathing, why food? See, if you didn't have to eat food, you wouldn't have pee. 
And why do you have to breathe? Because that creates the, the need for excremental organs also. I don't know if you're aware of how those organs work, but it does. Basically, without the oxygen, you, th there wouldn't be any ability to urinate or defecate. You need oxygen to do that. They, the, the, the organs need some kind of, you know, push, muscular contraction, which requires oxygen. Okay? So why did God create the human body that way? Because it's like, you know, real weak, real dependent, knowing especially what he knew about how it was all going to turn out. Because see, without those three things, without breath, without excreting, and without food, you can't live. Why make it so hard to even live? Sin created the need to work for those for food and shelter and clothing. You didn't actually need shelter or clothing until sin. Which means that bad weather came as a result of sin. God would have foreknown that. And thus the need for clothing. And of course Adam goes completely insane the minute he sins and, and starts to sow some itchy fig leaves blaming his genitals for his negative volition of God. He can't even think straight. So God goes and kills animals for the first time. And brings them skins to wear which, you know, actually do protect them against the elements. But they didn't need any protection against the elements prior. You see, to me, those are more fundamental justice questions than anything else that you can argue. Because you can argue, well, sin came into the world and therefore disease and therefore crime, yada, yada, yada. And of course, a good atheist would argue, well, yeah, but God foreknew that, so why did he allow sin in the first place? Bingo. Now, I think you know where I'm going with that, so I don't want to, you know, belabor the point. There are a lot of injustices that aren't as, what do you want to call it, traumatic as disease and war. But why have any injustices at all? Why have sin at all? Why have the freedom to sin? Now, you guys don't know that as atheists, but that's Satan's central argument in the Bible. Is that God made creation defective. Partly because, you know, the pee and the eating and the breathing weaknesses. Because angels don't have to do those things. And also, you know, the freedom to sin. If man didn't sin, all that evil we're all looking at wouldn't be here. And God's response is, truth be free. That's a hard answer. Truth has to be free to occur. So it goes basically like this. If there's a trade-off between freedom and hassle. There was a trade-off between freedom and hassle even for the angels. And they were made much higher than us. Satan fell before human beings were created. I mean, again, understand, I'm using the Bible's argument because, you know, so often this God argument gets focused on the Bible. Okay, so let's run with that before we get into what definition of God ought to pertain. The Bible's argument is that the angels were made first and they were all made at once. They were all made adult, they were all made perfect, and they were all made with perfect knowledge. But Satan rebelled in that state. So it wasn't all roses. There were shortcomings of one kind or another that he found upsetting. Now it is true, according to the Bible, that he, you know, everybody knew about this plan to make mankind, that the Son of God would take on humanity, which we know is Jesus Christ, and pay for all sins. They all knew that going in. That's in Isaiah 54 and Ezekiel 28 and other parts. And the idea was that they would get to parent 
the humans so they would learn why God's parenting love for them, the angels, was okay. Because they felt inferior to God too, obviously. So that's really basically why this whole thing is playing out the way it is. Now, Satan's argument back is, well, then you made everybody defective because you gave us all the freedom to sin and therefore all this suffering is really your fault, God. And God admits, yes, it is my fault in Isaiah 45, 7 through 18 and 19. But he claims his fault was to make Satan. That's in Isaiah 45, 7. I made the evil one. It says, I create evil in the translation, but that's not what the Hebrew says. It's an adjective used as a substantive, and so it means the evil one, a.k.a. Satan. Okay, fine. That's still claiming responsibility. Because Satan's the first guy who rebelled. And he's saying, yeah, and if you didn't give me the ability to sin, then all this suffering wouldn't have come on the angels. It wouldn't have come on the human race. You're just a sadist, God. And that's a hard argument to counter, don't you think? So it's a trade off then. Because if man doesn't have the freedom to say no to God, which is what sin means in the Bible, if man doesn't have the freedom to say no to God, then what is he? I mean, you're an atheist, right? If you didn't have the freedom to say no to God, then would you want to live? You see my point? Let's pretend, and I can't, I, you know, this is what if history. Let's pretend you wanted to say no to God, but you weren't able. Then you would want to do something you couldn't do. Or let's say you weren't even able to want to say no. Well, then what would you be? A Stepford wife. Little chirping, oh, how I love Jesus. Don't you hate that? Aren't you glad that you do, you're not like that? Well, the only reason, reason you're not like that is that you have the freedom to not be like that. Would you trade your freedom for what, you know, that you have now? For a condition where there's no suffering for anybody, but everybody's, you know, chirping in goose step to whatever God says. I bet you wouldn't like that. I know I wouldn't. If that's the definition of God that gets rid of suffering, then I don't want that definition. That's no God I want. So, I mean, think all that over. Because the justice issues are many. They are painful. I can't sugarcoat them and say that they're nice, but the basic thing boils down to a trade-off between freedom and suffering. The more freedom, the more suffering. The less freedom, the less suffering. That's what all of our political entities are trying to give us today, is a life with less suffering. But look at the cost. You have communism, which didn't work. You have socialism, which is trying to work and never really does. Then you have the United States brand of socialism, which certainly isn't working. Hasn't been for 50 years when we started it with Roosevelt. You know, not, not Teddy Roosevelt, but FDR. The U.S. has been a semi-socialist society from that point forward, when Social Security was invented. You see, I mean, there's this trade-off between freedom and suffering. The more suffering, the more freedom. The more you have a choice, you know, where to go in life. And of course, the harder it is to go wherever it is you want to go. Because you're doing it yourself. Now, I don't like suffering any more than the next guy. And it drives me absolutely crazy that anybody is sick. That hurts more than I can tell you. And I've been sick and I've been hurt and I've been tortured and all that other nonsense just like a lot of people could tell you. But somehow somebody else's pain is worse than my own.
but what's the alternative? That's what I want you to focus on. What alternative? What should have been the design of creation if God exists? If. Think that over. And let me know what you come up with, because I'd like to know. Seriously. And now I want to spend the balance of this, and I'm sorry it's going over 15 minutes, but this is not a soundbite question. Now I want to focus the last part of it on what definition of God ought to obtain. Because if you're going to answer the first question, what should be creation, you first kind of have to figure out, well, what should be God? And there are a lot of different ideas about God out there, you know, from time immemorial. Most of the ideas about God really aren't, don't deserve the definition God. Okay, they really amount to super creatures. Most of the ideas in history that are called God are really pantheonic, you know, polytheistic ideas of a bunch of, bunch of super beings who had a beginning, who can be begotten by somebody else, and they have superpowers kind of like, you know, a Spider-Man or something. For most of the world's lifetime, well, for all the world's lifetime, polytheistic ideas have obtained. Now, if any person called a god has a beginning, then who begot that god? So long as a god is begotten, literally begotten, then that person is not God. This is not the same as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God and adds humanity to himself. It's a dual nature person. That's not the depiction in polytheism. So I submit to you that any idea of God that has a beginning doesn't deserve the name God. Okay, but then you get into another set of conundra. If this God has no beginning, and that's the only definition that really makes any sense, especially in math, because you, the largest set would therefore be uncontained. And if you know about math, you know that a set cannot contain itself. Therefore, God would be the largest definition and would be the uncontainable set. It contains all other sets. So what kind of attributes would have to be in the uncontainable set? Well, personhood, obviously, because we, you and I are persons and we exist. So personhood would have to be an attribute in the uncontainable set. But that uncontainable set would have to be infinite in quality and therefore not corporeal. Corporealism would be a limitation, a finiteness, has a beginning. So the infinite that we're going to call God would have to be a person of infinite quality and no beginning. And infinity in math is, a, is the largest uncontainable set. Has no beginning, has no end, just is. In fact, a friend of mine named Symbolic in YouTube posited that math just always was instead of God. Well, maybe that's true. Okay, you could use that as your assumption if you want. Okay, but here's where you have the problem with it. We're persons. We're corporeal persons. Math is not a person. For the personhood attribute to exist in us, it has to be in the parent set. A personhood attribute can exist without corpus. Corpus is mass. So then... Math then would have to be a person and we'd have to call that person God. Okay, there would be certain other attributes that have to be present to warrant the name God. Omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, because these all relate to competence at Godness. You can't be infinite without those attributes. One would have to add love as an attribute. Because if this infinite person God hates, then nothing would exist. There would be no creation. It would be too annoying. What you hate, you destroy or avoid. What you love, you nurture and protect. So love would have to be a necessary attribute. Then you'd probably have to argue that th this God would have to be truth. 
because if false, then there's no competence. You see what I'm getting at? It's logical to back into what would have to be the attributes of the largest set and basically all the properties of math that I know of, and I do it for a living, back this up. Bible or no Bible? I'm leaving out the Bible for this. There would have to be, therefore, I mean, if no beginning, then you're talking eternal. No beginning, no ending, a stasis never changes. Because that, too, would be the property of the largest uncontainable set that contains all other sets. In other words, finity would be a subset of infinity. I'm sure you got that. I'm not talking about the, the, the layman's idea of finity, which is infinite progression or regression. The true definition of finity in mathematics is a stasis. So there's no change, therefore eternal. Therefore always existing, never had a beginning, never has an ending. And that fits with everything we know about math and physics anyway. You know how when mass dissipates, it turns into energy, that there's not supposed to be any information lost, although Stephen Hawking is wondering about that. You know, he used to say that, and then he changed his own paper. I want to say it was, what was it, 1994 or 2004, something like that, where he thought that there was some information lost in a black hole. I submit that it's not lost, it's just, it's just regenerated that a black hole is actually a star womb. But I digress. The point I'm trying to say here is that when you posit the definition of God, you have to think about it, I would propose, in math terms. True infinity means eternal personhood. Well, there personhood, then omniscient, omnipresent, otherwise it's not competent, and not, not omniscient. And obviously omnipotent, which would be a concomitant power due to omniscience and omnipresence. And it wouldn't even be omnipotent without omniscience or omnipresence. But omnipresence and omniscience wouldn't exist without omni omnipotence. So they all hang together. If one doesn't exist, the rest of them don't exist and we're not talking to God anymore. Okay. Um... Truth would have to be an attribute because that's math. All right. If falsehood, well, then there's no competence. So the word God wouldn't apply to this being we're trying to define. Now, you can add some other attributes, but as you can see, there's a, a logical connection in all of them. If not eternal, then not omnipotent, obviously. If not truth, then not omnipotent, obviously. If not truth, then not omniscient, obviously. Because truth would have to include a definition of all the things that are untrue. Because the truth about a thing that's untrue is that it's untrue. See how all this is working together logically? You don't even need the Bible for this. But once you start to chart out all these attributes, you start to realize something. Justice would also have to be an attribute. And if eternal, and if omnipotent, and if omnipresent, and if omniscience, and if truth, then it would only be just if truth is free. If Godness isn't free, then not omnipotent. You see the point? So then we're stuck whether we're talking Bible or not, we're stuck with this kind of harrowing conclusion that truth must be free in order to be truth. And then if free, it's going to have to be free to be bad, free to be good, free to be potential, free to be not potential, and therefore free to be painful. And to not decree, assuming Godness, to not decree that truth be free would be unjust. Okay, but then how does this Godness make just the injustice of a free truth? Yeah, there's the rub. And I've been trying to figure out how to answer that in its many forms. 
um, in my Sad Strat series now since last October. And it's not an easy question to deal with. But you tell me, is there a better design for the definition of God than what I just proposed? And you tell me, is there a better justice than what I just proposed? Because actually those two things are the very heart of what the Bible says is the trial between God and Satan. And I'm sorry that the pulpits don't know anything about it, but not all pastors are ignorant of this doctrine that goes from Genesis to Revelation. It's a centerpiece of the whole Bible. It's the reason why we got one. And granted, most pastors, most theologians are only, you know, vaguely aware of the issues. I'm sorry about that. But that doesn't render the Bible's definitions wrong. And if you've got better definitions, or another alternate holy book, or another alternate idea of God that's better, tell me. Peace out.